When scientists speak poetically about the light of creation, one is tempted to envision the Big Bang, and certainly that event has a strong claim to the title. For a span of time so minute that to it a nanosecond would be a near eternity, the Big Bang shined brightly enough to melt the laws of physics themselves. And of course, without it, our universe would not exist. But the Big Bang was less a moment of creation than one of destruction. The universe to which it gave birth was only possible in the elemental furnace of its momentary gestation, and, in the literal blink of an eye, had already collapsed. As space expanded around it, its edifice began to crumble, laws and particles tumbling from it as their foundations dissolved. A sizable portion of the universe's helium was forged in this brief period, when the pressures and temperatures of the entire universe were equal to those at the core of a star, and possibly primordial black holes, but neither would play a role in the subsequent drama. A better candidate for the title emerged 370,000 years later, when the universe's temperature fell to a mere 3,000 kelvins, and the seething plasma of particles could finally coalesce into atoms. With each coalescence came a burst of light, known as photon decoupling. Today, this era is preserved in the wall of the cosmic microwave background, the frozen image of the searing stellar surface that was once the universe. But this fog of hydrogen and helium was sterile. If things had continued as they were, it would have simply expanded into the infinite void, leaving no trace behind. After the incandescence of recombination, light could at last travel freely in the universe, except that there was nothing in the universe to produce it. As the hearth of its early years faded to black, the universe entered what astronomers call the Dark Ages. For a hundred million years, light, at least as we perceive it, simply did not exist. And then... We should be grateful that the universe was born imperfect. From the moment it began, tiny imbalances in the density and distribution of its matter and energy expanded with it until they comprised all knowable reality. These overdensities would eventually coalesce into larger structures, and their collisions would cause portions of the cosmic fog to collapse in on themselves. As gravity pushed downward, hydrogen was crushed under the weight and fused into helium. This first ignition gave the universe a new source of light, stars. These first stars, what astronomers call population three stars, were nearly devoid of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. Today, heavier elements act as a coolant for star formation, which limits their size. But in this first dawn, heavier elements did not exist, so stars could become gigantic. Some estimates place the masses of population three stars as high as a thousand times that of the sun. Such titans would burn through their fuel in as little as two million years, before either exploding in epochal hypernovae or collapsing directly into black holes. In their brief lives, these first stars would perform the alchemy of nuclear fusion. Hydrogen into helium, helium into carbon and oxygen, carbon into neon, magnesium, and silicon, and eventually, iron. Upon their deaths, they seeded the barren universe with these new elements, elements that became dust, rocks, planets, water, and life. The foundation of the spiraling complexity that comprises our world. The lives and deaths of these first stars were the true lights of creation in our universe. And from its conception, a founding goal of the James Webb Space Telescope has been to finally locate them. And in May 2023, it just might have done it. To date, the oldest stars definitely detected have been population two stars. Ancient red dwarfs and red giants enriched with only a wisp of the building material seen in younger population one stars like the sun which were born after Generation 2 had largely already lived and died. The oldest population two stars ever observed were born just after the Dark Ages, between 13.7 and 13.8 billion years ago. 
No Population 3 stars exist today, so to find them we have to peer into the past. Thankfully, the universe very kindly allows us to do that. Astronomy is the study of light, specifically the light emitted or reflected by distant objects. And since the speed of light is finite, the farther away an object is, the longer its light took to reach our eyes, and the farther into the past its image records. The James Webb Space Telescope is designed to see galaxies out to redshift 15, which corresponds to a time when the universe was just 270 million years old. That's after the era of Population 3 stars. But recent models have suggested that Population 3 stars could still form in pockets of pristine, to use the somewhat inappropriate term employed by the authors, gas in the halos of more developed galaxies. And that's exactly what a team led by Roberto Maiolino at Cambridge, employing James Webb's near-infrared spectrograph, believes they found. GNZ11 is one of those astronomical objects that astronomers hold off on granting an actual name until it changes the world enough for people to notice it. Its designation decodes as Galaxy Found in the North Field of the Great Observatory's Origin Deep Survey at Redshift 11. The Great Observatories in this case are the triad of the Hubble, Spitzer, and Chandra Space Telescopes, with the first working in visible light, the second in infrared, and the third in X-rays combined with other space and ground-based telescopes. Redshift 11 corresponds to a distance of 26.5 billion light-years, at a time 11 billion years ago. As befits a young, growing galaxy, GN is about 4% the size of our Milky Way, and about 1% its mass, but its star birth is in overdrive, 20 times that seen in our galaxy today. That, in conjunction with its active galactic nucleus, make GN the most luminous galaxy ever found at its distance. Within the diffuse outer halo of this child galaxy, and about 2.4 kiloparsecs to the northeast, Maiolino and his team identified what they poetically christened the clump, a region emitting the signal for doubly ionized helium, which, when combined with a lack of signal for anything other than hydrogen or helium, is considered the telltale sign of a population 3 star. The luminosity of the clump which is not augmented by that of the nearby galaxy, suggests a likely mass for the source of about 60,000 solar masses, with estimates for the individual stars topping out at 500 solar masses. That is about as precise a description of a population 3 star as you're likely to get. These stars, if confirmed, would be something of a living fossil, the product of a pocket of the earlier universe that managed to survive. Less than a month later, a separate team, led by Eros Vanzella of the Italian National Institute for Astrophysics, used James Webb to follow up observations of a gravitationally lensed arclet, as they call it, located at redshift 6.639, or about 800 million years after the Big Bang. The faintest star-forming region yet found in the era immediately following the cosmic dark ages. Dubbed LAP-1, for lensed and pristine, seriously, pristine? If that's pristine, then the human race is dirt. The arclet's low luminosity implied a total mass less than a thousand times that of the sun, while its weak spectral lines suggested a value for the amount of material heavier than hydrogen and helium at around 0.4% that of the sun. Which isn't actually that pristine. The lowest values ever recorded for stellar pollution approach a hundred thousand or even a million times less than the sun. So a good shot, but if I were a betting man, I'd go with Maiolino. Neither of these discoveries is absolute proof of the existence of Population 3 stars. But whether James Webb has found them or not, somewhere in the dark and formless void at the dawn of time, Population 3 stars are waiting. Even if they are still beyond our gaze, the primordial monsters from which our world was fashioned must exist. Hey fellow seekers, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe, or if you'd really like to help, check out my Patreon. Or if that's beyond your means, just tell someone else about my channel. An informed universe is a better universe.